Hi everyone, I hope all of you are well and safe. I'm Mary Ambach and today I will be talking about the regenerative treatments for radicular pain and facet joint pain. Compared to osteoarthritis, the research in orthobiologics in spine is still in its early stages. For radiculopathy and facet joint, it mostly involves PRP and its different preparations. There's no published research at this time on the use of other cell-based therapies from bone marrow or adipose for epidural or facet injections. For this lecture, I will be discussing the current evidence for the use of these biologics, specifically the platelet-rich plasma, to treat radicular pain and facet joint pain. I would also like to introduce a new concept in the treatment of spine pain, a paradigm shift, if you will, since the introduction of orthobiologics. So how can biologics help with nerve irritation and repair? Why do we use biologics to treat radiculopathy? These are some of the basic science, the preclinical and clinical data on growth factors, platelet-rich plasma and their role in nerve regeneration and axon growth. Autologous conditions serum or ACS and platelet lysate has also been have also been explored for radiculopathy. There's recognized role of nerve root inflammation in causing radicular pain. So aside from growth factors, strategies for inhibiting the biologic activities of interleukin 1 have been developed. Interleukin 1 is an inflammatory and catabolic cytokine, and it has been studied for its use in joint osteoarthritis. Its benefits for radiculopathy has also been studied. Platelet lysate is created by lysing platelets and removing cell debris, and the result is an injectate that is rich in growth factors and cytokines that are anti-inflammatory and they also promote tissue regeneration. The use of PRP for facet joint injection has largely been derived from the safety and efficacy of PRP in peripheral joints. The growth factors, cytokines, and the proteins help improve the pathology of facet joint pain by multiple mechanisms as shown in this slide. So let's dive into the PRP studies for radiculopathy. Becker in 2007 published a prospective double-blind randomized clinical trial enrolling 84 patients with six weeks of unilateral lumbar radicular compression. All these patients had disc herniation on the MRI and they presented with radiculopathy. They were divided into three treatment groups. The first group received ACS, second group 5 mg triamcinolone, and the third group 10 mg triamcinolone. They received a perineural epidural injection, which was described as an oblique interlaminar approach using a double needle technique. There was no mention of contrast used. The injections were performed three times, one week apart, and the patients were followed up for six months. So if you look at the VAS graph on the right, all the groups improved significantly over time with ACS showing superior outcome consistently. The response was similar in all the three groups initially, as you can see from baseline to four weeks. But after this time, the ACS showed consistent reduction in the VAS up to 22 weeks. However, the difference was only statistically significant um, between the ACS and the lower dose steroids at the end of the study. The disability index or ODI showed that there was no significant difference between all the three groups at any time, and there was no serious adverse events shown. Kumar in 2015 published a prospective study of 20 patients with at least six weeks of unilateral lumbar radiculopathy. They excluded patients with bilateral involvement, multiple degenerative disc disease, and stenosis. So the older population was excluded. Their mean age was 37 years old. An interlaminar injection of 2 ml of ACS was performed with a maximum of three injections at seven days interval. The number of injections were given based on clinical response. It was really unclear what the clinical criteria is on who proceeded with the second or third injections. 
but the average injections that the patients receive was two. Contrast was used. And um, as you can see in the results, the VAS and the ODI were all significantly improved at each time point, which is at three weeks, three months, and six months. The VAS improved from 6.95 to 2, and the ODI improved from 27.9 to 8.5. The physical component and the mental component scores of the short form survey also showed a statistically significant improvement at the end of the study. There was no serious complications or adverse effects. This study showed positive findings of ACS, improving pain and disability, and overall health. There was a small number of patients enrolled. Contrast was used, which may affect the ACS. We don't really know the exact effect of contrast on PRP at this time. There's some data sh showing that it may affect platelet activation and aggregation. The contrast effect is still unclear. Bhatia in 2016 published a pilot study, this time on the use of PRP, for patients with prolapse discs. It was a prospective case series of 10 patients with lumbar disc herniation, back pain with or without radiculopathy for more than four weeks, and interlaminar epidural PRP was performed and 5 cc of the PRP was injected. The PRP preparation and composition was not described. The procedure was performed under fluoroscopy. There was no mention of contrast used. The patients were followed, for, followed up uh, three weeks and three months and the results showed gradual improvement at three weeks then at three months. The visual analog scale was four or less in nine out of 10 patients. The straight leg raise improved in eight out of 10 patients and the modified disability questionnaire was less than 30% in six out of 10 patients, which is a minimal to moderate disability. Centeno in 2017 published results from their registry data. It included 470 patients with the inclusion criteria of lumbar radicular pain needing treatment. These patients were diagnosed by history, physical exam, and MRI consistent with their symptoms. The injected consisted of three things, platelet lysate, 4% lidocaine, and 100 to 200 nanograms of hydrocortisone. 3 to 5 cc of lysate was injected via interlaminar or transforaminal route a filter and contrast was used. And these patients were, were followed up to 24 months. The upper graph shows the numeric pain score data. 36% of patients were not able to provide baseline pain. The average pain change at each time point is statistically lower than the baseline. The function increased after treatment the modified SANE rating is shown in the lower graph. SANE stands for Single Assessment Numeric Evaluation. It asks patients what percent difference had they seen compared to their condition prior to the procedure, and it went from negative 100% worsened to 100% improved. Scores more than 0% is considered improvement, while negative scores means no improvement. 72 to 77% of patients reported improvement, 17 to 26% reported no improvement, so that's a quarter of the patients. Average rating showed 49.7% improvement at 24 months. 29 of the patients reported mild adverse events that were related to the treatment. So these are positive findings based on a large sample. There's a good number of patients that had not responded over time. And this resulted to a variable number of responses at each time point, which is an inherent problem with registry data. But this is real world data showing positive outcomes over a prolonged period of time. Korea in 2019 published a prospective observational non-randomized clinical trial, which used platelet-rich growth factors 
with the aim to improve disc degeneration. In vitro and in vivo studies have shown PRGF having an important therapeutic role in patients with IDD or intervertebral disc degeneration. We still need a standardized definition for the different PRP products, but PRGF means uh, it's mostly devoid of RBC and WBC with a platelet concentration hovering at two to three times baseline. So 250 patients with degenerative disc disease were enrolled. Uh, they had neck or back pain with or without radiculopathy. There was no mention of the chronicity of the symptoms and interlaminar epidural PRGF injection was done times two, six to eight weeks apart. 10 cc was injected in the cervical spine and 12 cc was injected in the lumbar spine. This was done under fluoroscopy. There was no contrast used. The injection resulted to clinically significant improvement in the VA, mean VAS scores from 9 to 2. The mean McNabb also improved from poor to excellent. And the need for opioid rescue also improved from 96% of patients needing opioids to none one year after the study. The MRI, I'm sorry, MRI was done one year after the second injection, which was documented in 50% of the patients. There was positive changes in a few patients. The positive changes were not quantified in the study. However, this is the first study that I have seen that actually documented before and after MRI changes. No complications were seen. As you may have noticed, there's variability in the protocols used and the methods performed in the injectate use. The techniques were different. Some use interlaminar approach, some use transframinal, while others use perineural injections. The number of injections varied from one to three. The interval between injections also varied from one week up to six to eight weeks apart. There was different volumes of PRP injected, anywhere from two cc to 12 cc. Different biologics were used, ACS, PRGF, platelet lysate PRP. Some studies added other agents like steroids and local anesthesia. In some studies, the PRP composition was not described and there was variable use of contrast. The lack of standardization in the use of biologics is not unique to spine studies, but it's more so pronounced due to the complexity of spine pain and spinal procedures. A systematic review and meta-analysis on the effectiveness of PRP and MSCs in managing low back pain and lower extremity pain was published by Sanapati, Manchikanti, and the group. And this eventually became the main resource for the American Society of Interventional Pain Physician Guidelines in 2019. This analysis included 12 lumbar disc injection studies, five epidural, three lumbar facet joints, and three sacroiliac joint studies. The review is limited due to the lack of randomized controlled trials, and as mentioned for the significant heterogeneity, there is no significant reports on quality of injectate and techniques, etc. And they concluded that the evidence for epidural injections and lumbar facet joint injections demonstrated level four evidence, which is limited evidence. Since then, Ruiz Lopez published a very recent clinical trial, which is a prospective randomized controlled double-blinded study. This included 50 patients with complex chronic degenerative spinal pain presenting with low back pain with or without radiating pain for at least three months. The patients were randomly allocated to either the steroid group or a leukocyte-rich PRP group. There's no details in the actual PRP concentration or if there was activation used, but a, a caudal epidural injection was done under fluoroscopic guidance using contrast. And there, this was a one-time injection. Patients were, were followed up at one, three, and six months. As shown in the graph, the 
Patients who receive steroid showed significantly lower VAS score at one month. However, at three and six months, the VAS scores for the PRP were better, showing a more sustained analgesic effect. With regards to the short form survey, the PRP and the steroid group both improved in the bodily pain domain. However, the PRP group had more significant improvement with the physical function domain, and it also had a consistently higher score with regards to health-related quality of life domain. There is no follow-up complications or adverse effects with both the steroid and the PRP group. This study had a short follow-up and there was no placebo. However, it showed positive findings showing more sustained effect of PRP compared to steroids with regards to pain and function. We still don't know at this time if a leukocyte-rich PRP or a leukocyte-poor PRP is more effective in treating conditions in the spine. The leukocytes in the PRP, as we know, have an immunomodulatory role. It has an antimicrobial role, removing bacteria and debris, and it can also enhance growth factor release. The neutrophils, though, in the leukocytes can increase inflammatory markers and can release degradative enzymes, enzymes <clears throat> which may oppose the intended effects of PRP. So now we are going into the facet joint studies. There's only a handful of published clinical trials using biologics for facet joint pain. This is the first of two clinical trials by Wu on a PRP use for facet joint pain. It's a prospective clinical trial enrolling 19 patients with facet joint syndrome. This um, patients um, were injected with 0.5 cc of PRP with four to five times baseline concentration. The facets injected were either at single level, multiple levels, unilateral, uh, bilateral, levels contrast was used and these patients were followed up at one week one month two months and three months the pain scores were significantly reduced at all time points after treatment 79 percent of the patients reported good or excellent outcomes at three months and the disability outcome measures were also significantly improved there's no adverse events so this study showed positive results in a small number of patients with short follow-up. This was the second study published by Wu. This was in 2017. So it's a prospective randomized controlled clinical trial. And now with a larger patient population, 46 patients with at least three months of facet joint syndrome. The patients underwent a facet block, which involved an injection of 0.5% lidocaine to the facet joint. Only patients with the positive response to the block were included in the study. There were two treatment groups. Group A received PRP injection of 4 to 5 times concentration, 0.5 cc volume, and group B received a combination of lidocaine and beta metazone. Um, again, the facets were injected either in a single level, multiple level, unilateral, or bilateral. And uh, the follow-up was at six months. As you can see in the image on the right, contrast was used. Similar to his first study, the patients who received steroids had less pain at one week and one month. However, at three months, and thereafter, the pain relief was significantly better in the PRP group. The same was true for the disability questionnaires, wherein in the short-term period, one week and one month, the patient who received steroids improved better than the PRP group. However, in the long-term period, three months and six months, the PRP group fared better. When the patients were asked about their satisfaction, the steroid group, 80% of the steroid group reported good or excellent outcomes initially, but this decreased to 50% at six months. However, for the PRP group, 
only 62% of them reported good to excellent outcomes at one month, but this eventually improved to 81% of them reporting better satisfaction at three months and six months. So this study showed that there's significant improvement in both groups for facet joint pain in the short term, but the PRP had the more sustained effect with regards to pain and function in the long term. Since the introduction of biologics, there has been a shift in treatment approach for spine pain or spine patients. In um, residency and fellowship, we have been thought the pain generator approach wherein we identify the cause of the pain and treat it. And spine is more than just the single parts, as we all know, it acts as one machine. And with the potential of orthobiologic therapies, we aim to deliver a more comprehensive treatment. We not only identify what causes the pain, but we also try to figure out why, and we treat the whole functional unit. For example, if a patient has a listhesis, these patients can develop facet joint pain, but eventually this can also cause a significant strain on the interspinous ligaments and functional instability. This can also lead to stenosis and radiculopathy. So we treat not just the facet joint, but we also inject the ligaments and we also inject epidurally. We treat all the structures that are contributing to the dysfunction. Kirchner and Anitua in 2016 published a retrospective pilot study of 86 patients with chronic low back pain, and they treated them with PRGF, injecting intradiscally, intraarticularly to the facet, and transforaminally in all 86 patients. And their results showed significant pain reduction, as you can see on the graph on the right, 90.7% of the patients showed excellent response, which they defined as a VAS 1 to 3 at 6 months. Dr. Atluri presented in the IOF conference in 2019 a controlled prospective trial of 70 patients with chronic low back pain, wherein they injected bone marrow concentrate therapy into the discs, facets, epidural space, and SI joint and or SI joint, depending on clinical presentation. And they f their plan is to follow up these patients for one year. They pre he presented this, their six month uh, results, preliminary results, and it shows promising data with bone marrow concentrate therapy showing better pain and function than control. This is our clinical trial which is a personalized multi-target biologic injection in the spine. This is a prospective case series of 46 patients wherein PRP was injected into the facet joints, intervertebral discs, epidural space, and or the paravertebral muscles. This is an individualized multi-target PRP injection as opposed to the prior study by Kirchner and Anitua. The follow-up was one year and our results showed a statistically significant improvement in pain with the mean VAS from 8.4 to 5.5 at one year and the disability from 18 to 10.7 at one year. 54% of the patients were very satisfied and 63% would definitely repeat the procedure. There was also a significant decrease in reported medication use and there is no serious procedure-related adverse effects. This was using a PRP from a low-cost technique that was previously published by Machado. So these are positive results from these initial studies using multi-target biologic treatment approach in the spine. And I suspect we will be seeing more and more research published using this approach. And with that, I end my lecture. Thank you so much for your time.